Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. I have a I have a, a version of the comic book industry in my head, you know, and it's a version that I don't see really reflected in a lot of the media outlets that cover comics, you know, and I kind of see see this industry as kind of sacred, like in a lot of ways. Like I feel like it's. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Short Box Podcast, season six. Short Box Podcast was recorded before a live internet audience. Yo, Short Box Nation, nice to have you back. I told you we'd return to the swing of things this week, and here we are. New friends and first-timers, welcome to the show. This is the Short Box Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast while you're here, because next week, the full crew, including Ashley and Ed, will be back to play catch-up on the latest news and comic book headlines. You won't want to miss that. In the meantime, you're now tuned into episode 319. My name is Botter Milligan, and I'm joined by my co-host and right-hand man, Cesar Cordero. True, true. And while we're on introductions, let's go ahead and give some recognition to the people who help us Let's keep the lights on. Starting with the comic shop and a proud sponsor of this show, Gotham City Limit, Jacksonville's premier place for comics, toys, collectibles, and more. If you live in the area or if you ever find yourself passing through Jacksonville, stop by the shop on Southside Boulevard and tell them the short box sent you. Lastly, we want to spotlight the best patrons a podcast could ask for, and that's our Patreon subscribers. We could not maintain and grow this show without their help. So if you like what we're doing and you want to support our content and be counted among the short box elite, consider joining our Patreon community. You can visit patreon.com slash the short box or click the link in the show notes. Now it should come as no surprise for those of you who tune in on a weekly basis that here on the short box, we, we specialize in a few things. We love to discuss comic books, whether that be new ones or the vintage kind. We also love sharing worthwhile recommendations with you and the rest of the short box nation week in and week out. But the thing we enjoy the most here on the show is doing all of those things with the best creators in the industry, as well as special friends and guests, which leads me to this latest short box guest of honor. His name is Mr. Troy Jeffrey Allen. He's the marketing content manager at Diamond Comic Distributors and host of their pop culture network, Previous World. You can find him and his co-hosts on the Previous World YouTube channel, serving you and other comic fans around the world, the latest comic book, graphic novel and pop culture merch news previews releases and more he's on our show this week to chat with us not only about the perks of working for previous world and, and all the cool people he's gotten to, to interview and chat with but also why the monthly previews catalog both the the, the big behemoth sized uh, phone book that you can get in, in your comic shop right now or even get a digital copy on the previous world website we're going to be chatting about why that catalog plays such a large role in the comic shop experience for fans and retailers 
light. Troy's also got a uh, MF Doom tribute comic book that's available at the time of this recording on createtheculture.today. Shortbox Nation, let's welcome Troy Jeffrey Allen to the show. Hi, Troy. How are you? <laughs> welcome. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Yes. <laughs> So far, so good, man. Um, good. I'm I'm actually really stoked because uh, I I can remember the first time I looked at a previews and I was very young and it had Ghost Rider on the cover of like '90s Ghost Rider and it was t- tremendously scary. <laughs> 90s Ghost Rider was kind of intense, wasn't it? Like, you know, hey, if you're yeah. in a religious household, <laughs> definitely. Know, yeah. You know, like my mom and dad were just kind of like, they're very, very religious and they're Puerto Rican and they're like, uh, we don't want this in this house, which made it like, Ghost Rider's my dude now. Yeah. <laughs> I got to seek out all the Ghost Riders. I, it's that forbidden fruit, right? Like, I mean, you can't tell a kid, like, I was actually, I just did a panel a few minutes ago uh, that I jumped off of to do this and uh i was talking about the, one of the earliest comics i ever saw that had like black characters in it and it was actually like this anti-drug uh uh storm power man comic uh that they were just giving away to my elementary school and i remember it just it took me forever to read it because my parents wanted me to read it <laughs> like, <laughs> of course like, and i'm like the best strategy that they could have ever done is just like troy don't read this comic and then i would have read it oh so, sure for sure I, you know, and put it up really high you know somewhere to right, make yeah, it a yeah. challenge you know? oh dude i think right. you and i both were talking about the anti-drug uh spider-man power man team up with him and they oh, were yeah, against yeah. Uh, a character named smoke screen oh yeah he's trying smoke to get screen. people yep. to, to cool. smoke or neat it was awesome because <laughs> i was like you know everyone knew who spider-man was but that was my first introduction to luke cage and i was like who the hell is this guy this dude's awesome like he hates cigarette smoke (laughs) (laughs) you know uh, i was i was uh chatting with uh warren you know good friend of the show shout out to to warren in the simpsons greater than podcast but i was talking to him about you know us having troy on the show and um you know and explaining like previews and things like that and he was like yo wait a minute I actually have a previews from like 94 with like yep. Bart Bart on it. And I won't lie, it it was sure. – I, I had a feeling – like I, I knew previews has been around for as long as at least I've had a poll at a comic shop. But I didn't think – I didn't know it went that deep. I didn't know previews catalog was around since like the early 90s. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, actually I think the first issue – like I actually just had a meeting with uh, one of my coworkers. They told me something I didn't know, which is that uh, yeah, the uh, catalog – was named something else, like I think, like the first couple of issues. It was, of course, a much smaller, looks much different. And then I guess uh, previews, previews catalog and name came about, like, yeah, about early 90s around that time. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it's been one for a long I, I remember actually speaking of uh, uh, previews memories, I definitely remember, uh, I remember it being the thing that I bought when, like, you know, you get your allowance, right? Yep. And, I would buy previews because it was still cheap. And like, you know, it's even by state standards, still pretty cheap. And um, I would always get like, you know, a couple of comics I wanted, but I always buy previews because to me, I felt like I was getting more comics. If that oh, makes yeah. sense. You know, even though they weren't actual comics and I could like look at the art and stuff like that. Like, oh, this is coming out. This is coming out. Maybe I would never read it. But I distinctly remember uh, Batman vs. Predator being the first oh, copy yeah. I ever saw. It was on the cover. And it was, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it was Andy Cooper. Uh, on the artwork and like yeah that was like the first previews I ever saw and actually my buddy uh, a childhood friend of mine so Eric Ford he had a copy of it and I was just I was just hoarding it like you know like let me keep looking at it go away <laughs> and, uh, he's like it's mine and I'm like oh no it's not <laughs> true I, I am so glad that you said uh, you know how how previews is sometimes substantial enough to kind of scratch that uh, that comic itch right because I was telling see I remember when I was collecting I feel like every single title that was coming out on the shelves that there was some months where I was so broke from buying like comic books that all I could afford was the previews and I was yeah. still pretty happy about it like I yeah. still yeah. had like that itch scratch for like new comic books and stuff like that oh yeah yeah and also to say that like yeah I think Purchasing comic books was my first experience of like actually have actually being forced to understand math. Like, you know, of course I you know, I've been school and all this other stuff and whatnot, but like I think it was around that time that like I really understood like, okay, these things are not finite and I have to save money in order to spend money. <laughs> like you right. know what I mean? And how to, you know, and like how to almost uh, negotiate with your dollars how much story you can get out of this, like as a kid. So yeah, definitely definite childhood memories. 
Troy, I, I wanted I want to take a, I had a feeling that you know when we, when we get you on the show eventually that it would feel like you know the, the missing friend that you know we've always like known <laughs> and whatnot. So this is already off to a good start. But I wanted to take a step back because we all know that a, a good superhero comic starts off with a captivating origin story. So I wanted to ask you: Can you recall the moment that you became a comic book fan? And then I have a vague memory of some issue of Spider Man with Nova and Spider Man on the cover. Like, and I remember, I kind of remember having that, but not really being interested in it. But I know for a fact that the catalyst for me becoming obsessed with comics was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There you um, go. Um, prior to that, I had been reading, reading a lot of Archie. And, like, you know, and I mean, like, just like straight up Archie, like, you know, uh, was it like Laugh? The little digest books. Sure, the double digests. Archie's, yeah, I, yeah, I cut my teeth on those. Is yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, speaking about negotiating your dollars, right? Like, sure. You know, grandma, grandma was only going to spend so much, so it was like, well, this is a lot of comics and like a small package, like you know. You get the Dan DeCarlo style, you know. Yeah. I mean, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, but I do distinctly remember, like, yeah, becoming shifting towards being completely obsessed with Ninja Turtles. And I can't remember if it was the cartoon that kicked it off or the movie. Um, but, uh, around that time, Archie started making Ninja Turtles comics. So yep. they were age appropriate. I had no idea about the Mirage Studio stuff. I just knew about the Archie books. Um, and initially they were just adaptations of the TV show, but then they started to branch out and actually started to get a little bit weirder and weirder as they went along. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that that was like my earliest memory is like, of like really diving head first into comics. Um, and like, you know, and, and like, now, I wouldn't even say collecting them, but when I saw them and I could buy them, I would get them, right? And then the X-Men boom happened. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And that was it. The ruination. Like, that, that was, yeah, that was everything. <laughs> like, that was the, that's the end of story. Like, it was, uh, yeah, Jim Lee on Chris Claremont's number one. Come on, and, man. And then I dovetailed it to X-Force and, like, Rob Lyko, and Vivian Cieza. And, uh, yeah, I think, but at the time, uh, simultaneously, it was, uh, John Byrne and Wilson Protest. It's Mark Sylvester. Or maybe it was Wilson Protest. I can't remember now. Um, on Uncanny. And yeah, it was just, it was just a, yeah, embarrassment of riches, man. Was, <laughs> yep. I'm all in. It like, was, really was The best of the yeah, best. So, so yeah, I'd say that's my, my, my origin story. Nice. So, so what comic shop do you, do you call home nowadays? And, and are, do you like what comics do you go in that gets you excited? Like, what, what are you excited to pick up from your shop on a weekly basis? Oh, so my point. Uh, so I'm really excited. That Deadly Class is coming back. Uh, I've been a huge fan of that book. As a matter of fact, we're going to do a, a little uh, book club episode next week. Where we're going to talk about Deadly Class. Um, but yeah, it's been on hiatus since about I want to say summer of last year. Uh, and it did on a cliffhanger, and so yeah, that's definitely a book that I'm uh, I'm just getting back into because every issue just like there's something almost kinetic about it. Like it's just it's got this just this high energy, and it's just like bouncing off the walls, and I love it. Um, I am actively I don't know are we here we go I'm actively uh, reading Spider Man Life Story, um, and I just saw that they're going to do another an annual like a little short annual yeah. um, about it, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm feeling out Spider-Man, nonstop Spider-Man from Marvel. That's another one that uh, I'm kind of like, oh, let me see what this is. Like, I, 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 I'm a sucker for Spider-Man, you know, especially when it's uh, self-contained Spider-Man at this point. So definitely a fan of that. Uh, X-Men by Jonathan Hickman. I, you know, they tricked me a little bit with uh, Ten of Swords and I started trying to read all the books and then I read all the books and I was like, you know, what? no shade, but I was like, I'm just going to stick to the Hickman group. The Hickman written ones, like that's 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 my bread and butter. And like, if I miss out, I'll I'll just piece it together later. And uh, what else is with my cool? Um, first of all, my comic shop is Alliance Comics and Games in Silver Spring, Maryland. So shout out to them. Uh, I feel like oh, uh, Green Lantern just wrapped up. Uh, well, not just wrapped up, but like a couple months ago. Uh, no, actually, it was a month ago. Grant Morrison put out his final issue, um, and so I'm playing catch up on that. But that was also my pull. Then I found out that Grant Morrison's doing a Superman Authority comic, which I don't even understand how that's going to work or what that is, but I'm all game for that. Wait, you, you said a Superman and an Authority comic? Yeah. Oh, and, it's, and it's Grant Morrison. And it's Grant Morrison. What? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> also, did I, did I catch Maryland? Did you just say yes. Maryland? Yeah. I grew up in Waldorf. Okay. There you go. All right. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, uh, Waldorf, let me. 
Waldorf is like Waldorf is weird. Waldorf is you, yeah. You could have just stopped it. Weird. Yeah, it's super, <laughs> it is ridiculous. It's so far out. Like I mean, well, I I mean, I guess compared to other places, like I actually drove through Waldorf to visit my mom in North Carolina. I, I know so many people who are really connected to people like, oh, I came from Waldorf, I came from Waldorf. And I'm like, where is this mystical place? It, <laughs> you know? It, it, is, it is underneath the Domino's pizza oven. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. It's, it's, it's a gnarly place. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I, like, I've driven past it, but like, yeah, maybe I need to just check out Waldorf because apparently that's where all the, all the nerds are. Uh, it's like a nerd mecca, I guess. But yeah. So from being captivated by Jim Lee and, and Chris Claremont, you know, uh, mm-hmm. monster A plus, like, you know, all star team up in, in comic books mm-hmm. to now, uh, uh, you know, toting the, the title of marketing content manager at, at Diamond yeah. and, and, you know, being the, the, the face of, of one of many faces, sorry, of previews world. Um, I, I was curious about like what, what your responsibilities, uh, are at, at these companies and, and, you know, how did you land the job working for, you know, previews? Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Shortbox store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. Um, you know, so the funny thing is, uh, I, uh, so I used to work at a comic shop. I used to work at Alliance. I was a manager for like about six years. And uh, I kind of hit a point while I was still in college where I was like, okay, I need to get a real job, right? Um, but I also did not let it go. So I was like, you know what? I'll work on Sundays because I like my discount and I like comics and like all my friends are here. So, you know, uh, and um, uh, it, during, the, during the process of like working in the quote unquote real world, right? Um, I realized like, uh, you know what? Like, maybe I can get a job in comics. So I kind of tried to apply for Diamond Comics Distributors because they're in Maryland. They're in the same, the same state I live in. And never got anything back. So I just kind of kept toiling. Like, you know, I worked at the museum. I worked at a, you know, a lot of museums in D.C., of course. And uh, I worked at National Geographic for a while. I worked at SNSU.com for a while. Um, you know, I worked for National Archives for a period. Uh, and I actually, my last job before this was Ancestry.com. Oh, wow. I got laid off. I got laid off. And just on a whim, and like I was kind of kicking myself. I'm like, oh, I should have been applying for jobs. should have been applying for jobs. should have been applying for jobs. On a whim, I decided, you know what? Let's see what the diamonds do. Like, let's see if they're hiring for anything. And they were looking for a social media. They called it a social media associate, right? Uh, so I applied. And I went in to interview with uh, the market, the then marketing manager, um, Andy Mueller. And he kind of, <laughs> he asked me a million dollar question, right? I think this is the question where he reads out like, you know, the, the posers from the real deal, right? He goes, so, so what are you reading? And I said, well, right now, um, I just wrapped, it was around this time. Uh, uh, it's like, I just wrapped on, on Kenny X-Force, love it. And I'm really, really into Django versus Zorro from Dynamite Comics. So good. Right. And I feel like that was enough of a deep cut mm. that he was like, oh, he, he was ain't faking like, it. He ain't faking it. He ain't faking it. This guy's for real. Right? <laughs> so, um, and then he, t- you know, Andy's a chatty dude, but like he talked to me for like another hour after that. 
And I walked out. It was the first time I ever walked out of an interview thing. Like, I feel like I got the job. Oh, that is such cool. a good feeling. I love oh, it, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you're like, thank you, Don Diego de la Vega. You know what? <laughs> you don't, you don't even mind your phone, like, you know, going on low battery. It's like, look, I already got it. You know, like I'll, right. I'll, I'll look at the acceptance letter when I see it. Right. See it right there. You go. Exactly, exactly. No, legit. Yeah. That's cool. And, um, so yeah. So I, no, I told him in social media for a while, like I'd been doing social media for other people, like uh, like as a side hustle, kind of, like I did it for Action to Go Go, which I was also like managing editor of, we just talked about action movies all the time, it was my other love, right? Um, and then I actually, this is the thing, I'm starting to notice the thing, I also did social media for Urban Action Expo, which was like more of a uh, you know, black exploitation martial arts, so it was like this New York convention that uh, is still going every year, and I'm still doing social media for. And um uh, you know, things just started to shift and uh, more and more, the more time I stayed at Diamond, the more and more I kind of had, I kept getting bumped up more and more. Like, you know, and so I went from social media associate to uh, editor, you know, and then from editor, like I kind of started like saying like, you know, we could do more, we could do video, we could do this, we could do that. Like, you know, and they started sending me conventions to interview people and it seemed to be working out pretty well. So they just kind of like, we'll keep going. Real quick, I wanted to know, do you remember some of the comic conventions that you were going to early on and some of the people you were interviewing? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was actually the big ones, which was kind of like, I'd never been to San Diego Comic Con before. I actually, it seemed like something to be anxiety inducing, and I just didn't want to do it. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I, I think something weird happens to you when, uh, when um, you've worked in a comic shop for several years. You know, and then like you get to go to something like San Diego Comic Con or New York Comic Con, you're sort of like, eh, I'm okay. Like I don't necessarily, I like I don't need to shout out the money for it. I mean, if someone else pays for it, I'll go, and that's ultimately what happened. That's the and, dream, right there. And then it turns out, like you know, I go to San Diego Comic Con, I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe I was wrong about this the whole time. Um, but uh, yes, it was San Diego. It was the three, the main three we always did is Baltimore, which is in our backyard. Um, New York Comic Con and then San Diego Comic Con. And then uh, the year before COVID, we went to uh, uh, Emerald City Comic Con. And that was another eye opener because it was like, I'd never been to Seattle before. So I was sort of like, oh, this is cool. Like, I like I like this convention. It's like real breezy and everybody's real laid back. Um, so yeah, like, uh, and I, you know, I just kept doing that. Like, I just, I just got really comfortable. Usually when I get comfortable, I'm like, oh, <laughs> but um you know it then last year they brought me up to, to marketing manager um and we have you know we have a new regime at our, our, our in the marketing department like uh there's been some transitions in the last year and you know that's to my own i just feel like they saw the value in me and so they were like let's put you right in the slot and see what he can do and so you know it's been only a couple months like i think it's been it was back in november when i got that uh I got that call up, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been cool. Like I'm, I'm you know, I, I like I'm, I feel like in a lot of ways I'm trying to remake. I'm trying to make the comic book industry in the industry that I see the comic book industry in. I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and that's not even to say that I'm playing God, but like you know, it's just sort of like I'm. I have a I have a, a version of the comic book industry in my head, you know, and it's a version that. I don't see really reflecting a lot of the media outlets that cover comics, you know, and I kind of see, see this industry as kind of sacred, like in a lot of ways. Like, I feel like it's, it should be untainted. It, like, you know, it should kind of remain pristine and I want to uphold that, but I also want to make sure that people understand that it is inviting. So I don't want to be the, the dreaded gatekeeper. You know what I mean? Like I want people to understand, yes, comics are for everybody, but at the same time, look, it takes a special breed of person to even want to get into this in the first place, you know? Um, and so to kind of lean into that so that it's being inviting, but also kind of almost, you know, give you almost a, the red carpet treatment at the same time. That's kind of my goal. So Got it. Right so you're Mr. Glass. Got it. Let's keep going. Um, <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> right. Yeah. So Mr. Glass, exactly. <laughs> so, so Troy, I, I, I was curious to, um, I, I was curious to hear like, 
you know, and, and we 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 like to think that you know at, at any moment we have listeners who might not be into comic books. You know, we definitely cater to uh, uh, new comic fans as well as like the know-it-all gurus who's been around for a while. But in, in the in the happenings that maybe someone is tuning in who's you know still kind of on the fence about jumping into the world of comics, what exactly does previews provide for people? I mean, what, what are they getting for previews, and what are you doing with like you mentioned the YouTube page and, and having you know interviews done there? Can you go into a little more detail? Yeah, like, uh, so previews, are, look, it's been around for uh, almost 30 years. Um, it is the, basically the comic shop's resource for how they order stuff. And it's been that way for a very long time. Um, and so basically what it, the way that it used to work, which we're going to start reworking in the, near, in the next couple of months, um, is that uh, you would get the catalog and then you as a consumer would kind of write down a little order sheet what you wanted. And then you can send it to your comic shop and your comic shop will order it for you. Um, and that would be in addition, of course, to your monthly poll. Uh, like, you know, that's, of course, how you discover new titles that are coming out. Um, and it's also just how you, uh, you know, it's just how you discover the world of fandom in general. Like, you know, like it's two months out. So you're kind of getting a glimpse into the future. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been that way for a long time. The catalog has kind of been the, 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 the bedrock for which like a lot of the, how Diamond operates. And so it's kind of has two sides to it. There's a retailer side that really uses the previous catalog, right? They really lean on that catalog for a lot of their material, a lot of their uh, merchandise. And then there's a the consumer side, which I think, look, if you are a savvy consumer, familiar with the comic book territory, um, then you then you know how to use the previous catalog. But if you're if you're somebody who's just walking through the front door, and like you know if you were you know twelve uh, year old Choi who just picked it up because he didn't have a lot of cash and like you know you wanted to you just love the the Batman vs Predator cover, uh, you you know like I'm hoping that those are the people that we can also capture with this like you know what I mean? Um, so like you have those two sides, and I feel like it's been a bit of a disparity because I feel like the retailers have been on it a lot as they should. But I mean, I need the consumers to lean on it just as much. So that's kind of my current goal is to really zero in on the consumers and make sure that they're aware of what's available and, you know, also digitize it, making that available on the Internet to, for people to also pre-order so. And for anyone that, you know, has never picked up a previous, it is literally a phone book size catalog yes. of comic books, merchandise, paraphernalia, apparel. Just imagine the nostalgia you felt back in the day when it was the Scholastic mm. Book Fair. Oh, come on. Yes. see. And yes. you had that flimsy little newspaper. Not, they don't right? remember. And you open it up and you're like, oh, my God, will my mom let me get a Bill Watterson, Calvin and Hobbes? <laughs> oh, imagine yeah. that. But now a tome, if you will, a biblical yes. tome that can sit in your lap and you can just sit there for hours and get lost. I remember also looking at a previews and finding the, believe it or not, the soundtrack for Batman, 89, like the Prince soundtrack, not the orchestrated mm-hmm. score. Um, both are, in my opinion, hot take, both are good. I enjoy them yeah. both, but I'm a huge Prince fan, so I'm biased. Um, but that said, it is it is a ginormous book and it's amazing. This book is so massive that there's a mini book that lives inside of it yes, for just yes. Marvel previews, right? Yeah, dude, I yeah. laugh when I saw that. That was awesome. So, but but yeah. what I wanted to to get at is that um, you know, I love that you guys still have this physical giant book of nerd gold available yes. at the shops for under five bucks. I think, like I said, I there used to be months I used to just pick it up just to have like something to read. But it was cool to see during my research that you guys are advocating and then pushing for like the digital version. You guys even have like yes. a previews app. I, I saw that as well. And then, you know, on the website, there's a bunch of helpful uh, information in the catalog there, too. W- was that kind of your doing, going like more of that digital route, knowing that, you know, everyone's got a phone? Oh, absolutely. I have to give total credit to Andy, uh, Andrew Mueller. Um, like, you know, he was already leaning in that direction in general. Um, and of course, he was the guy who hired me. Uh, yeah. And so my I'm at a point really where I'm basically taking an Andy, the foundation of Andy Bill, and I'm actually just trying to lift it and bring it on over to the final stages so like a lot of um the catalog is like you said like it's a physical catalog but what we're, what we're doing is and this was andy uh they put it all on previous slash catalog so you can get the physical catalog if you want to and i know that there are people that prefer just flipping through the catalog i know some of our some of the videos they've been like i'd much rather just get the catalog and flip through it right but for those of you who just 
want to discover what's at your comic shop or just look at pretty pictures or just want a database of artists and writers and like, you know, all that stuff. Previsual.com slash catalog is where you can go or previsual.com slash search. Um, and like those are, that's there literally so that you can see what's coming out, what has come out already. You can keep track of your pull list, et cetera, et cetera. And so then on top of that, uh, hopefully in the coming months, very soon, um, uh, there's going to be an option to pre-order through our website directly to your comic shop. And that's called Pullbox. Oh, that's cool. So definitely could keep an eye out for that. That is really cool. I, I'll, I'm going to give previews some more props, especially the catalog, because um, when I was working at a comic shop in like the mid, I don't know, 2000s, 20, early 2010s, previews put me onto a lot of manga that I wasn't like, uh, like I, I didn't know what was was available in the States. Um, and, and for sure, you guys definitely put me on to Udon when they were doing Street Fighter stuff, like all the Street Fighter art books that are now hundreds of dollars. Uh, it was thanks to previews that I w- had a heads up on them, you know, um, even even to this day, you know, previews is still putting me on to um, to new things like uh, lately, you guys have been putting me on to, you know, indie comic book publishers and i wouldn't even i wouldn't even call them really indie but like vault and awa like you know you guys dedicate a lot of time to not only the big three you know your marvel your dc and your uh, image but you guys give a lot of uh, uh pages and spotlights to smaller comic book publishers that are putting out really great work that have like yeah. a plus cast creators um i i do appreciate yeah. that a lot you guys cover uh, the full spectrum of comic book culture you know yeah, yeah, and I mean that's that's really what it is. I mean, it's it's you know it's, it's you know like if you if you like to enjoy your comics without the noise of the internet, right? Like that's what we're trying to provide people. You know what I mean? Like it's you know I think that uh, you know you and I are in the cartoon escape babe group, right? And so that's why I'm there because like you know and again I just I don't like the conversations around the comics like that people are having in the open, whether it be Twitter or, or like Instagram or Facebook. You know, even some of the websites, I won't call them out. You know who they are, right? Um, but at the same time, I've called them out a couple of times. Come on, Troy, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know the usual suspects, yeah, yeah. right? It's like, yeah, that's the, I mean, yeah, long story short, that's, that's the goal is to like allow people to enjoy comics, you know, without like all the additional noise, just to enjoy the comics on their terms and to provide like, you know, access to those things. Because I also don't think that a lot of those sites actually provide access to those comics, which is something that we can do, that we can provide, is giving you a direct link to, this is the book you want, and this is how you can get it. So, so and and I want to kind of shift from, uh, you know, the, the print side of, of previews and talk a little more about the, the digital side, you know, because you guys have, you know, uh, I know that you... Uh, I'm judging from all the, the posts that I've seen you make on that Cartoonist Kayfabe group. Shout out to Eli, by the way. Um, hey, shout out to Eli. That... You post interviews. I think you've done a few, quite a few interviews with comic book creators that you post on the Previews World uh, website. But the YouTube channel too, man. Like there is not only I, I think you mentioned like uh, the the weekly book club, but you guys do like weekly uh, kind of chats about like the different comics coming out. But you and and some of your other co-hosts are responsible for some really solid interviews. I think just on the front page of the Previews YouTube page, you've got an interview with Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti. Uh, the Todd father, you know, you got to interview the Todd father about the Spawn universe and a whole other yeah. slew of them. Can you talk about some of the uh, comic book professionals that you've you've interviewed and maybe some of the different segments uh, on the YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we've definitely, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like I think there was a stretch, especially last year when everybody was home where I was like, you know what, I always want to interview this person, I'm going to interview this person, you know? And so it literally was like, you know, Rob Liefeld has a G.I. Joe comic. I'm going to crawl into his DMs on the previous little Twitter and ask him if he can uh, do <laughs> an interview for it. Which I imagine the response is a lot better when you use like someone, something like the previews Twitter account oh, to yeah. like ask oh, for yeah, an interview. Yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Although I think, if I remember correctly, uh, Rick Remender, uh, who does Deadly Class, he's written at Kenny X Force. Um, he just had a show called American Crime based on his comic on Netflix. Um, Rick Remender, I just kind of like, blatantly asked him on my Twitter. <laughs> like, I was like, can I interview for this thing? And he was like, yeah, sure. So, you know, I think it really depends. Like, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I think yeah, saying previews kind of helps. Um, but, uh, yeah, to answer your question about interviews, like, yeah, we did one with uh, Rick Remender, uh, Rob Liefeld, 
Um, I did a three-parter with John Romita Jr., which I'm hoping, it's already up now, but like I'm hoping that we can start going back to that once COVID's over. We did that at San Diego Comic-Con. I got to sit down with him for like an hour and he just opened up. Like he just told me everything that I wanted to know about his career, which was great. Um, I got to do one, another three-parter with Garth Ennis, which was a big deal for me personally. Um, and like, I literally asked him everything. I was like, Hitman, Preacher, Punisher, Nick Fury, like all of it. Like, I was like, I want to know everything. Just, just give it, just, just tell me all the stuff. Um, and I'm hoping I can continue doing that. I've actually interviewed Tommy Bravo like twice. Actually, three times, really. I did a written interview. You don't have to. Uh, now you're just, now you're just dunking yeah, on us. Yeah, this is a hard now, flex. Now you're, just, right now. now you're just dunking on us. Yeah, yeah. We get All it. over we our get face. It. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Thank Sorry, you, Troy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this guy. <laughs> this guy, right. No, well, I, I, I like that you're doing three-parters with people that, you know, deserve three parters jr jr yeah. garth Ennis. that that's great that you have like that flexibility to you know go as long and as deep as you want into some of these like you know right. bodies of work mm-hmm. um but yeah and on top of that we do have a regular program and we do our show previews a weekly uh which but here i'm actually like, you as well like i'm inviting you guys to come on like i like i got the already lined up oh we'd love to come um, on that'd be great but you both can come on that week if you want to if you're both available um, uh, but like, yeah, the idea is, uh, we just fill you in on what's going on in comics every week. Like we talk about and just and things surrounding comics too. Like, you know, I think it's, I've kind of had this attitude, you know, somewhat, sometimes controversial attitude, but I think that now it's less controversial. Record, record, uh, record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, internally controversial, I'd say, I should say, is that like, we need to be uh, like previews, maybe not necessarily done, but previews can be responsive to the conversations going on around comics. And so I feel like that's been some of our best episodes. Like, I think that um, we did one about, uh, you know, there was the Capitol riots, right? And there was like a, a bunch of people who stormed the Capitol that had Punisher logos and go for like a week. People were canceling Punisher, right? And like, there was a conversation about should Marvel even punish, uh, punish should Marvel even uh, uh, publish the character anymore? And, you know, I... It's like we got to talk about this. Like this is this is our backyard. Like this is the thing that Marvel's not going to talk about this, right? Right. And honestly, honestly, they should not because like all they would be doing is adding uh, fuel to the flames. But I'm like, we can talk about this, and uh, you know, so we do stuff like that on the weekly show. But we also do like kind of like just you know goofy like BS things. Like we did one, uh, uh, we did one for the election where we kind of like pit a bunch of characters against each other to see who's presidential. Like, you know, so it came down to like, I think it came down to like Duke from G.I. Joe and like Mal Reynolds from Serenity or something. Oh, my like that. God. <laughs> That's like, awesome. You know, and we went we went full like, you know, talking head, like news pundit on it. Like, you know, my coworker Ashton, she wore a uh, ghost. Ashton, she wore a blazer. I wore a blazer with a little, uh, with a little uh, America pin. And like, you know, we been. We shouted each other down like we were on Fox News. It was, did uh, right. did Optimus day. Prime get the independent sort of vote, like non-party right. affiliate, because he's a robot? Maybe <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you know, I got, I got, I got uh, Optimus Prime got shouted down because well, he's he was in the he was in the running, but he got shouted down because he's, he's not from Earth. Mm. Oh, but he's there's more than meets the eye to him though. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah, I tried. He I shows tried. up, he's just like, I'm running on a platform of education reform. So, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> We can get good. there. He's got my vote. We can get behind him, you know? That was pretty good. Actually, that was impressive. Thank you. Like thank, you thank you. Please don't blow his head up. He does this every episode. He's usually got really good voice, but I don't let him know how good he is. You, you know? know, words hurt sometimes, man. You know that, right? So so that's that's really cool that you've got the freedom to, you know, express your honesty and your truth about, like, the things that you read, you know? Because like, yeah. that's always, that's one of my gripes when it comes to some of these other, like, uh, new sites and publications is that... It's like you guys know this is shit, you know, like 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 you guys, uh, you know, and and I don't blame them, you know, they got they got stakeholders and, and people to to please as well. Um, but I, I, I that is cool that you get the ability to where you're not having to be like a company man, you know, like you can kind of have these kind of tougher conversations that even the publishers might not be able to have. So it's cool to think that you know previews is its own kind of. Uh, in a way, like its own kind of independent, like news outlet, you know, talking about the right. things that you know anyone listening to this show probably would absolutely enjoy. Yeah, yeah. no, and that's I mean that's been the whole thing. And like again, there's been a there's been a kind of a give and take there. I definitely got a call. We did a Punisher episode, <laughs> right? uh, but 
Hey, but in all honesty, the call I got wasn't about like don't talk about it. It was just sort of like, so what are you gonna say exactly? And like I, you know, I'm not gonna say who I talked to, but I was definitely my boss, my boss's boss's boss. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I said, like, look, at the end of the day, I, I'm a big advocate of you know, let artists be artists. You know what I mean? Like, don't like if you don't like something, don't punish the artist for it. Like, you know what I mean? If you have an issue with the Punisher logo, like, and you want it to be taken off the shelf, look, comic book artists get paid crap anyway. So, like, the fact that I think it was a, a magazine name, I think it was Ross Andrew and Jerry Conley created this character. This character has been going on for decades, and now you want to take, now you want to take him away. I'm like, and I saw a creator saying this, and I'm like, as a creator. Like as a creator, you should not be okay with that. Right. Like, that's a problem. It's a bad precedent to set. To set. So you know, and so I made it clear to uh to my boss's boss's boss, right, that uh, like, look, at the end of the day, I'm here to dis- I'm here to defend the industry. Like that's just how serious I am about this. Like I don't want, I don't want, I don't want misinformed conversations to inform conversations about comic books. You know what I mean? Right. And so yeah, like. Once I said that, the, con- the the whole give and take kind of stopped because it was like, okay, well, this is this is what Troy's going with, and it makes sense, you know. And another argument was like, look, people are talking about it anyway, so mm-hmm. right. it's not like us not talking about it. It's gonna make it go away. It's here. So yeah. right, yeah, you're not so much moderating the conversation so much as navigating the waters. Exactly, 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 and that's really what it is. Like I think that that's all you can do in these internet streets, right? Like, you know, you might. You might get gunned down if you're not careful. So all you can do is be like, look, this is my take. And this is what people are saying. And you decide for yourself. That's what we try to do every week on the show. Um, and then, like, yeah, we have the book club that we do. Uh, we have a debunk series that I'm hoping we can bring back in the summer time called Mangapedia, where we talk about, we get to the specifics of the, the world of manga. Like, hmm. we talk about honorifics, you know, like, who is senpai? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what does that mean exactly in the framing of manga? Like, what does that mean culturally as well? Um, and Anamia hosts that. She, she's really great at that. Uh, she also hosts the panel, and we do that every month. Um, uh, you know, we do we do trailers for comics. Like, yeah, trailers are going all the time. Oh, that's cool. Marvel and DC. And uh, maybe not so much DC lately. But <laughs> uh, we get Marvel and Image and Dark Horse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we do like, you know, we do our own 360 videos of toys that are coming out. So you can see like a, you know, of course, you go to the website, maybe there's just a static image of a, mm-hmm. of a figure or something like that. We can go to YouTube and get like a nice, you know, full circle uh, shot of the Cool. Did a bunch of McFarlane ones recently for Justice League. Oh, like yeah. Toys. I saw it was the Aquaman. I saw that. Mm-hmm. Legit. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, we try to keep it, we try to make it engaging and we try to engage and we try not to steer away. And like, I really do kind of feel like, you know, Diamond Comics is its own thing. Mm-hmm. And previews has to kind of be its own thing for that sole identity. And for a lot of people, I think that they're not one of the same anyway. Like, I feel like if you're getting the previews catalog, you're not necessarily thinking about Diamond. Not you know at all. I mean? That's true. Not yeah. at all. And if you're thinking about Diamond, you're you're adding all this other stuff to the conversation. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So maybe you're not even looking at the previews catalog. So, you know, what's been some of like your highlights or proudest moments working the job? It sounds like you mentioned like being able to interview Garth Enos, ask him all these things and JR, JR. But what are some of the other uh, projects or initiatives that that you feel most proud of? Uh, Man, Uh, you know, so one of the things I started last year, actually before last year, um, I did a series called Got It Covered, uh, where I basically, you know, I wanted to get more art on the website like i was like i want to focus more on art like i am look i write comics like you know what i mean i will never denigrate comic book writers i'm not one of those people that's like oh the art's more important than but at the same time i understand that like look i got into comics because of artwork like you know what i mean like as a kid you see something badass on the cover something cool something you know something cool something sexy something badass something awesome doesn't matter what it is sure like that's drawing you like comic book covers are the billboards for the industry, you know what I mean? And so they grab your attention and they pull you in. And so what I wanted to start doing was focusing more and more on comics, comic art, because I noticed that we were doing a lot of writer interviews. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, not, not to undercut the writers that have interviewed, because some of, you know, they do interesting things, they do great stuff, but uh, they, they say a lot of the same things, like, you know what I mean? And this is a visual medium. 
And so what I decided to start doing was I started asking artists to give me a cover and then break it down. Like, you know, like a lot of artists work on uh, work digitally now, so they can easily just kind of go, okay, take the color layer off, take the uh, inks off, the inks, you know, whatever they call them now, uh, get to, to the blue lines, um, you know, throw in some thumbnails because I want people to see the process. Because I think another thing that people don't really understand is that people, I feel like a lot of people outside of comic fans don't understand that people make comics. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I remember when that was the realization for me. Like, I was like, wait, Stanley, this guy Stanley, who whose voiceover is on like these cartoons, makes has made comics. Like, you know what I mean? Um, and so, like, yeah, I just, I, so that was a bit, I felt like that was something that like, I was really proud to start doing. And we're still doing it, which is great. And I feel like the real test of how great that was is because I started getting publishers asking me about it, which had never really happened before. Like, you know, typical question, like, hey, you want to do this thing? You know, you want to do this written interview with this writer? You want to do something with this writer? So, and then, like, I did a couple of Got It Covered articles. And, yeah, I got people coming in saying, like, you know, emailing me, like, can we do a cover, cover interview with, like, you know, with this person, with that person? So, and I got to interview some really cool people too. Like, you know, I got to, one of my favorite artists right now is ACO. Um, he did like, uh, uh, he did a. <laughs> isn't it Last Runner? Didn't he, isn't he doing Last Runner yeah. for AWA? That dude is amazing. He's amazing. And like, he, but like, ACO's tough. Like, ACO's real, like, he's, he's got it. And, uh, you know, he did a, a, a book called uh, Fury, uh, Nick Fury with uh, James Robinson and Marvel. And that was the first time I ever noticed his work. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like, you know, and for me, it's also fun to kind of research these people a little bit more. Like, and because of the ACO interview, I, I didn't realize that he did Midnight or DC, like, you know what I mean? And so, like, just kind of tracking people's careers and kind of talking about it. They also do it in more of a, uh, a prose format instead of a, a you, know, you know, previous world. ACL, previous role, ACL, previous, you know, that sort of like interview breakdown. Because I, I want to romanticize it a bit. I'll be honest with you. Like I want it to be, I want it to be something special. Like I don't want it to just kind of treat comics. I don't want to treat comics like the way I feel like too many other sites treat comics. It's just like, you know, just get it out there and move on to the next thing. You know, I want people to kind of sit with it and understand why these things are special, why they're interesting, why they're fun. I wanted to give you props because as as a duo that has interviewed, you know, a, a pretty significant handful of writers, writers and artists, that is a very unique way of getting artists to kind of come out of their shell. Because I find that writers are always ready to talk. You know, they are exactly. great yeah. mouthpieces. Artists, not so much. You know, they're, they're definitely a lot they let more. the artwork do the talking. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. what a great way of, of getting them to come out of their shell than to talk about, you know, their artwork. Well, and I, I think that's cool that, especially, like you said, with the digital route, it is a lot easier to kind of maybe pull it up and, and do those breakdowns. Yeah, art and artists are writers in their own right, not writers essentially as far as words are concerned, but like storytellers as well, right? Like they, it is on their shoulders to create the visual story that is being told through sequential art. It's it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and like you said, they're not always that Gabby, but you know, you, you right, get them right. talking about their artwork, it'll, it's definitely a, a good show. For sure. And I mean, I also tell you too, like, I mean, look, not a, not a lot of writers, not a lot of artists are the best writers, but I'm like, look, I'll like, just answer the questions. I'll clean it up. Like, <laughs> right. you know, like whatever. Like, I just want, I just want to know more about your process and how you do this. And I want people to see what you do. You know? hmm. So, yeah. And, and you know what? Speaking about writers and, and artists, Troy, I'm I'm fortunate to have chatted w- with you a few times prior to this interview, and I also follow you on on a few you know social media platforms. So I'm aware of some of the projects you work on outside of Previous World. But our listeners, of course, may not be aware of your involvement with with you know a Rexco Comic Company. You know, you're you're a mm-hmm. co-founder of that. And um, surprise, surprise, everyone, uh, Troy is the writer. I'm, I'm assuming so uh, of an upcoming MF Doom oh, tribute. Yeah comic book that i think it, this interview will come out on wednesday and i think your comic comes out on tuesday right tuesday yeah 420 yep, yep yep would you be kind enough to speak about some of your other contributions to comics outside of your role at previews uh yeah so when i was uh working at the comic shop about let's say 2008 um and i was at this point i think i don't think i was manager anymore i think i was just kind of working on the side but uh you know i had this buddy of mine jay Payne. uh he was an, he's an aspiring artist and him and I used to talk about wrestling, like, all the time. Like, you know what I mean? Um, and so he had this idea for this 
wrestling comic called Bam. Uh, and I, and you know, I just, I like, I kind of hit that point where I'm just sort of like, you know, I've been reading a lot of book. I've been reading a lot of Warren Ellis. I've been reading a lot of Grant Morrison. Um, I've been reading like all the Vertigo guys. I'm just, I was all over that. Like I, like Mark Miller, like all those guys. I was just obsessed with the British Invasion guys. Like that was my bread and butter. And they got me back into comics, truthfully. And so I just, I kind of hit a point where I was like, I want to write a comic. Like I actually want to do this. And I've been writing articles about comics, like, you know what I mean? Like various sites or whatever. Uh, and then of course, you know, blogging was like the thing to do at the time. So I did a lot of that. Uh, but I was like, I want to write a comic. And so Jay kind of trusted me, you know, a little bit <laughs> to like write this, like this, this angsty teen comedy about like this pro wrestler who teaches these, like these high school kids how to fight against, fight back against bullies. And it was very much, it's called BAM. It's all webtoons right now. And we're actually in the process of finishing it. Um, I just met with Jess, Jay last week. You've shown me thumbnails. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it kind of, and I also simultaneously was actually volunteering for conventions. So I kind of started to get the idea of, okay, I can go to a con and sell this con, you know? And so the first convention I ever did as a, as a, as a, as a creator was a uh, small press expo. Um, which, you know, at the time was like a great place to kind of like, you know, get the confidence to like, uh, to, to sell your comic to people. And so, you know, I, Jay and I have been doing BAM off and on for like a couple of years. Like we probably dragged our feet a couple of times on it, uh, just cause of life, like, you know, really, that's all it really was. Um, but in the in between time, I just decided, you know, I'm doing BAM, just didn't do one. I'm just going to do much short comics. And so I started reaching out to a collective of creators called the DC Conspiracy, and they were putting out anthology books. And uh, I ended up looking into this book, uh, the short story that I did about the guy who designed the inauguration badges for the Metro Police for President Obama. Oh, wow. And I, this, this guy, he's still a friend of mine, DJ Jackson. Um, he came into the store. And, you know, it was just like him and I would just shoot the shit all the time, you know, just talk or whatever. And then one day he's like, oh, hey, I got something for you. And he gives me this, this badge. And I'm like, it says like, you know, 2008, you know, inauguration president of Barack Obama. I'm like, oh, damn, okay, cool, man. He's like, can I keep, I can keep this? Like, yeah, you keep it. And I didn't think much of it until a couple of weeks later. And I was like, and then I got offered this opportunity to do this book called District Comics, An Unconventional History of Washington, D.C., which is where I'm from. And uh, the editor was pitching is part of the DC conspiracy. The editor was asking about who wanted to be involved. And I was like, you know what? I want to find out more about this, this inauguration badge. Um, so, you know, they linked me up with uh, an artist named Jeff McCulsey, who does, uh, does books like Food Bar and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and we did this short comment basically about Barack Obama and DJ, <laughs> like the guy who, brought, um, who designed his badges. And that's probably the most I won't say well known, but it's the thing that I've done that's gotten the most traction at this point. Um, and yeah, and when I say traction, like you know, I got featured in the Washington Post, like it ended up in like you know a couple other publications on top of that. Um, and then the book itself as a whole, the anthology, got nominated for uh, 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 was it a, a Ringo and a Sheldorf Award and a couple other things, you know. And so after that, I was like, I I need to, I was like, I need to play a job. We do more stuff. We do more stuff. And so, yeah, that got me, you know, I started talking to people at conventions and then I met Nick Allen and we started doing Fight of the Century in a relation. We started doing Fight of the Century together, um, which is still coming out now. Um, and yeah, and that brings you up to like current times where like uh, I'm doing this uh, MF Doom thing. And I actually had to put together a, a little write up uh, today because the book is dropping on the 20th uh, about why I did it. And it really, I, like, it kind of forced me to actually really sit down and kind of be like, why did I want to do this, you know? And I realized it was a couple of things. Like, one, 2020 sucked. Absolutely. And then to kick the chair from under me even more, they took away my favorite rap. Oh, my like, God. You know I mean? Like, on the on the last day of the Man, year. Man, was it? <laughs> it was almost unbelievable. It was like, no, this is some fake news if I've ever right. seen it. And boy, right. was I heartbroken when I realized, right. oh. This is real. <laughs> really? Like, I mean, like, I literally, like, I'm sitting, I remember sitting on my computer and we were just kind of, me and my girlfriend were both kind of like getting ready for like New Year's, like just kind of have this indoor celebration because of course you couldn't go anywhere. And I looked at my phone and forget my language. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and I like, I had just got my phone a month ago. So understand like I threw it on the ground because I was just done with the year at this point. Um, but I kind of had to kind of reevaluate 
you know, my experience with MF Doom. And it kind of made me realize, like, look, for me personally, uh, I was introduced to MF Doom in high school, um, like right on, like, you know, right before I transitioned into college. And for me personally, like, you know, we talk a lot about black nerd culture, nerd culture, and all this other stuff. Don't look that name nerd, but, you know, whatever. And um, he was like, the, he was like the, a forerunner of that. Like, before there was a term for that, there was MF Doom and there was Jean Grey. You know, also put her in that category as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I just remember like it gave me an additional inroad to hip hop that I think I had kind of lost at that point. Hmm. Like you know, um, and I th- and there's a bunch of reasons for that. I think that like you know after the murder of Tupac and Biggie, like the conversation about hip hop shifted probably for the better because then we started to get a lot more party music instead of for like, sure. the next rap stuff. Um, but I also kind of felt like there was something that was kind of, you know, I don't want to be too harsh, but there was something, there was, it was the wrong kind of juvenile to me at that point. So I kind of like shifted away from that stuff. Started listening to like, you know, more ju- the other, the right type of juvenile, which is like system. Well, actually, that's, that's, I can't call system dumb juvenile. But, you know, I was listening to new metal and stuff like that. I was, you know, it's the early 2000s, right? Um, I love that and, you just said new metal. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, I gotta frame it correctly. I know this. Not even it's, just, it's just metal, uh, you know. But I mean, like, yeah, I was doing. I was born to the more angsty stuff at that point, right? It was like the Lincoln Park and like the Deftones. Deftones. Yeah, oh yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and so I kind of just kind of transitioned away from listening to a lot of modern hip hop. I said I like the obvious club stuff, and then I discovered all this underground stuff because they love to. You know, I discovered Jim Clay. I discovered later on Aesop Rock. Like you know. I, I discovered Stone Throw Records. Like, yeah. I discovered all this stuff. And so it kind of shifted my perspective of hip hop, um, or at least like re- allowed me to reevaluate what I loved about it in the first place. And to actually really pay attention to what I loved about it in the first place. And so, yeah, I say all that to say, like, yeah, I just, this past week, I really kind of had to sit here. Well, actually, just the last several months, I really had to kind of go, you know, why was this so important to me? It's because it was so formative. Like, and I did this little write up earlier, but I called it up doing like a muse. Like, you know, like I really do think that's what it was. Like, I think that it was important to, for me personally, to kind of see uh, someone who was cool, someone who didn't give a shit, <laughs> right? Someone who was black, right? But someone who embraced all this weird pop culture stuff that I grew up on, you know, like the Marvel characters and the Saturday morning cartoons, and, you know, but also take it to a level that made it, made it his own. You know, and that was kind of like, yeah, that was like a big creative inspiration for me. And like, I really had to come kind of to terms with that these last several months after he died. So, yeah, I just kind of was like, I, you know, and like immediately after he passed away, I was like, I got to do a comic. You know, I was like, I have to do something. I, mean, I was like, I'm going to do a comic book because it makes sense to do an MF Doom comic book. I've never seen an MF Doom comic book. I'm like, I've never seen one before. Um, and so I started making calls to people just to be like, what artist can I find? And, you know, what can I do here? And um, uh, yeah, it just it came together. And, like it looks freaking beautiful. Like I'm excited for people to see it on the twentieth. Like it's just it's just a love letter to MF Doom. Like straight up. Like it's releasing it afterwards. So I can tell you this much. Uh, uh, you know, it's unauthorized, right? Like it's not done. You know, I didn't ask permission to do it. It's totally free to the internet. Um, at this point, when this airs, you'll be able to just read it online, like on my social media, or like I'm, I'm watching it on a website. Uh, just to house that particular comic, so this just archived forever. Um, but uh, yeah, I just—it's really just about the MF Doom sound and visualizing it. Like that's the whole point of the comic. Is I, you know, I didn't want to put words in his mouth. I didn't want to, you know, editorialize. I didn't want to make it. You know, at one point I was saying like I should make it about how hip hop sucks now, and like MF Doom was one. Of, and I was like, you know, I just kind of had to dial all that stuff back. I was like, you know, that's not. I'm not. I'm not I shouldn't be preaching on his behalf. Like, you know what I mean? I should make a story that's about him. And I said the one, man. I'm actually really proud of it, too. Like, you know, like it's just cool. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't wait for the 20s yeah, to me see too. it because yeah. I've, like I said, I've seen the preview pages and it looks like just a blue line art, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. that you've posted so far. And it looks good. It looks like something, man. And in all honesty, I feel like he'd be proud of because, like you said, outside of, I think, of a, a, of a rap, really good rap song, the next best way to uh, memorialize and pay, you know, respect to MF Doom would be a comic book. That you makes know? total sense. Because when I, when I think about MF Doom, you know, 
Um, I think the first time I had heard a comic book reference in rap was probably Method Man. You know, I, I think Wu Tang wore their comic book love on their sleeve, way on, literally on their sleeve, right, big time. Yeah, but MF Doom, I felt like took that love and just went into the deep end with it. He did not yeah. care about you know how what you thought about him or the, or the visuals or what a a quote unquote rapper should and sound like. Like he was. Yeah going to bar you to death about the Fantastic Four and other obscure pop culture references that maybe no one else had, had ever watched. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny, actually. It was one of the other thing I had to uh, reevaluate. It's like, when did I start seeing comics and superheroes like kind of really come into play with uh, hip-hop? And you know what's funny? It goes way, way back. Like, it goes back to Rapper's Delight, and, like, there's a, there's a, there's a line in there, and that's really inappropriate, but there's a line in, in Rapper's Delight where he talks about Super Strong, <laughs> like, you know, it's about <laughs> Superman yeah, and yeah. Lois Lane, but, I mean, it's in the song, like, you know what I mean? And then, like, you also look at those guys, like, you know, you look at, uh, 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 you know, any of those, like, early, like, those early uh, rap groups, uh, they were really kind of coming from a place of either, you know, martial arts movies or superhero personas, even maybe a little bit of wrestling. It was all kind of for sure that, especially that the new york scene oh like definitely i mean oh definitely it doesn't doesn't in, in hindsight does i mean it was probably very apparent you know as the, in, in during the time but cold crush for brothers the furious five plus you know uh yeah. five plus one more like those all sound like superhero team names oh, you know yeah. like marvel yeah. you know comic book names and stuff so I mean, furious five sinister six thank you <laughs> so yeah yeah i like i just i you know, making that connection. Uh, and I mean, I've heard these things before, but really kind of understanding that it was actually really cool. So yeah, I'm excited for it. I, I hope people appreciate it. I hope people don't feel like I'm exploiting him because I'm not, I'm really not trying to. It's just that I think the dude was dope. Like I really thought he was just so dope. And like, I'm always kind of fascinated by people that I can't figure out. Mm. Like, I feel like I made a, I, you know, I look at the people that like uh, have influenced me and it's kind of like all over the place. Like, it goes from Jackie Chan to Robert Rodriguez to Grant Morrison to, like, it's all over the place. Barack Obama's on the list. And it's, I think that the fascination for me is, like, I can't pinpoint what makes them great, that they're great. You know what I mean? And therefore, they're always going to be great because you can't find the, you can't find the uh, the formula. Mm. You know what I mean? So... He's on that list, and I do for sure. His 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 you know that aura of mystery to me is yeah. is what makes him so fascinating. Because even in in his death, you know, I've been listening to a lot of uh, other podcasts that have interviewed his friends, and even like the Stones Throw uh, um, uh, label uh, owner, which escapes me at the moment. But even they speak about him in ways of like, well, I only got this piece of him. You know, I've only got this piece of him. So it's it's cool to see that even his closest friends still had you know even they didn't have the full picture he just remained a mystery to everybody um so so troy i i, I will go ahead and let our listeners know that um I, i'll i will link to that mf doom comic when it comes out it comes on on the 20th this episode comes out on the 21st so right. i'll be sure to link that out in the uh, the show notes and i want everyone to check it out especially um, our hip-hop head listeners but um uh, troy i want to get back to this previews because like i mentioned Earlier, you're the reason that I'm probably going to eat nothing but but ramen in the next two months. Don't put this on him. <laughs> Don't put this on because him. My you're catalog, a grown-ass man. Because my catalog is bookmarked and ear earmarked to to death. Um, there you go. And I I wanted to have some fun with it, right? With, with this month's catalog and things like that. And I gave you the challenge of of trying to find maybe you know two or three items in this month's previous catalog that you would recommend our listeners strongly consider putting on their order form or going to their comic shop and, and asking them to, to order it. Well, you know, and I said that it could be, you know, it could be comics, it could be graphic novels, toys, or whatever else you feel like is really cool. What are some of these things that you want people to have on their radar? Mm. Um, you know, uh, actually, you know, it's funny. Uh, I just opened a uh, com slash catalog, right? And there's actually a top ramen parachute plush. I don't even know what that is. See, he's got you covered if you're in poverty. Even previews has that. See? You're good, Blotter. You don't need money. Yes. It's like this plush doll that has a parachute that has a ramen on it. Top ramen on it. I don't know. Bizarre. We get, we, get, we get like weird stuff like that, which I also think is part of the fun. And, and, and I'm I, like, God, that's so weird. I'm just like, yeah, see me like with my phone, yeah, adding to, to, uh, to cart. <laughs> you know, I, I, I give because I, I go to Gotham City Limit, and I will, always, I always tell Ben, the owner there, that he gets some of the coolest 
shit I have ever seen that I could never <laughs> like expect. I'm like, where did you think to find Batman rubber duckies? Like, I actually bought some. Uh, you know, no shame. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, where do you think to find this? And he's like, that was in the catalog. It was in the Oh my word for word, he was like, yeah. it's in the catalog. So it's, yeah. I, I, well, I, I think it's safe to say previous catalog and, uh, you know, and even like, I think the diamond side is literally like the lifeblood of a lot of comic shops. Like without you yeah. guys, they would not have nearly all the cool merch that you see when you go in. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, look, there are other distributors. Like I'm not going to say Tim. Like I know a lot of people are freaking out about the Marvel thing. Uh, you know, I, I said this in another stream. I'll say the same thing here. Look, Marvel's doing what, every other publisher has currently is doing currently and they've done for like years, which is like they have two distributors. Like some have more than two distributors because certain distributors come to certain markets. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where like, you know, we are, we are the lifeblood of a particular segment of the industry, but there's also room to share, you know, and also with fandom becoming so expansive and just kind of shifting and changing, like as time goes on, it has to. So it's fun. For sure. Well said. And, and so, so back to our game. So you found a a, a, a ramen with a parachute plushie. What else do you got for people to check out? Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I got to point out, yes, uh, Deadly Class. I'm obsessed with Deadly Class. I love Deadly Class. I think the artwork's amazing. I think the book is just the right kind of unhinged. I mentioned that I'm like I'm like one of those guys that got back into comics because of things like Vertigo, uh, because of things like The Authority, like I mentioned earlier, um, because of stuff like Grant Morrison's new X-Men and the Ultimates. That's what got me back. Preacher, that's what got me back into the comics. The so, new metal's starting to make sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. I, I totally get it. I was listening, I was listening to System of a Down and reading Preacher. Like, that's know, like, awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm definitely a product of my time. But, uh, I love yeah, it. Yeah, like um, a Deadly Class, uh, it's just I kind of have always felt like it's in that name. It's just, it's got that right edge to it. I feel like comics don't really work there. We, we, we joke about uh, the cartoons, KK, we joke about Awa comics, right? I feel like Deadly, Claw, Deadly Class is one of those uh, titles that's like falls in that category. It just feels a little bit dangerous, a little bit doesn't care what you think of it. And that's perfect. That embodies, uh, that perfectly embodies what I think comics should be in that perfectly embodies what this comic is. Uh, so, yeah, they're moving on to their, uh, their back and they're, they're in this particular catalog, they're in their third issue, but. The first issue of their new return issue hasn't come out yet. Uh, I'm actually also curious about Spawn Universe. Um, I'm, I'll be honest. I'm not a big Tommy Farrell Spawn fan. Like, I just, that's not really been a thing that I've always been into. Uh, but talking to him, first of all, the interview with Tommy Farrell is hard not to get excited about, like, whatever he's talking about, right? Like, he just sells it so good. And also, I kind of feel like it's a no brainer that, like, yeah, Spawn clearly has a universe. And, like, yeah, let's see what else is in that universe. Like, you know, I mean, he's, you know, I mean, truthfully, he's had like a lot of great writers also right now, including himself. Like he's had Neil Gaiman. You know, I guess we don't really want to talk about that. Either, but, <laughs> you know, he's had Grant Morrison. He's had Frank Miller. Like you know what I mean? Like, and so everyone has been contributing to telling the story. I know Jason uh, Sean Alexander is one of the most recent guys. Um, and so yeah, it's really cool. Brian Michael Bendis also wrote Spawn and stuff. Is on top of that. So yeah, like the universe is already there. Now he's just kind of like playing in that in that realm. You know. Um, and I'm not looking through the catalog lines. I'm just looking at slash catalog. Um, I'm actually, so, you know, I, I rage quit Star Wars, I feel like, every couple of years. And the reason, and it happens every couple of years, and I get sucked back in. Of course, the Mandalorian pulled me back in, right? Um, and then on top of that, like, some of this Marvel stuff that they're doing in the comics is pretty cool. So there's this war of the bounty hunters. And look, Real talk. Not only does not only is Empire Strikes Back a good Star Wars, a great Star Wars movie, right? It's a great movie. Like it's beautiful. It looks great. Like it's written perfectly. Like it's, like the acting is executed so perfectly. And so to get a story that's kind of bridging, which is what this is, is telling the story of what happened with Han Solo's body, and like you know the transport of Boba Fett's transport of that body after Empire Strikes Back. That's the story I always wanted to know. You know, like that's the story I've always wanted. Um, so yeah, I'm actually really excited about that. That's Charles Soule, Steve McNeven. Steve McNeven. Isn't it great to see Steve McNeven doing interior artwork again? Yes, yes, yeah. I was about to say he's another one of those 2000s guys that like, yeah. I mean, come on, he did Civil War. I just reread Nemesis, which is actually completely insane, and I would not recommend it to everybody. But <laughs> it it's, is insane. It's insane. It's Mark Miller, and it's Mark Miller during his. I feel like he's mellowed out recently. Mark Miller during his Edgelord days was like 
quite a feat. He was quite a, yeah, he was the edge but lord poster child. That was like an update. Yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, but I ate all that stuff up because I was just like, you can't get this on television. You don't get this in the movies. Like, you can only get away with this in comic books. That's For why sure. I liked it. Um, I'm actually also curious about Fantastic Four Life Story. Uh, Mark Russell's doing uh, his version of what Chip Zdarsky and Mark Bagley did. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's got some Daniel Kuna covers, which I love Daniel Kuna. But I'm also kind of curious about this concept. Which is bridging off the Spider-Man's life story concept of what if these characters aged in real time? And you know, at first it's sort of like, okay, this is a cool little what-if story. Like, you know, old man Logan kind of is doing that, did that too in a way, in his own way, by aging the characters. But to kind of see how like each decade and the events in each decade impact these characters directly. Like I feel like Marvel's always, you know, they always say that the, the world outside your window, right? So Marvel's always kind of been responsive to the zeitgeist, right? But to kind of see, yeah, like, it's might have been like story, seeing Peter Parker struggle with, should I go to Vietnam? Should I not go to Vietnam? Like, can I make a difference there? Like, is this something that I should be getting involved with? Like, you know, I think all that stuff is really interesting to do. And I feel like that's what uh, Mark Ross is doing. Um, uh, (laughs) There's a book, I'm really excited about Behemoth Comics. um, And they have a book, I'm just going to say it. There's a book that they're putting out uh, that's uh, an adaptation of a motion of uh, a motion by a French uh, animated film called Motherfuckers. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I've never seen the cartoon. Um, but uh, it looks interesting. It looks, again, it's a little edgy, you know, which I also kind of appreciate. Keep it rolling, Potter. <laughs> Keep it rolling. <laughs> this is the good you know, stuff. Um, Hey, it just looks cool. And I think Behemoth's doing cool stuff. They did a Hotline Miami comic. They, they got some really interesting, cool stuff that they're doing. Right. Um, at Pisker's Red Room, I'm actually very curious about it. I've been funding Red Room on Patreon, but I haven't actually been reading the comic, which is you know, horrible to say, because he didn't like giving me bits and pieces on a regular. Um, but I also knew that there was a physical version coming out, so I could do it later, so I'm actually oh, yeah. excited about that. And that's how, that's how I'm, I'm waiting on, too. I'm, I, I was like, I'm, this one looks like something I need to hold in my hands. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Uh, there's a there's a really cool book that's got comics of Tales Told in Technicolor, which is kind of like a Tales from the Crypt type thing that they're doing, but it's going to be Ooh. kind of modernized, which I also think is cool. Um, and what else? Oh, and then, you know, look, if you're looking for merchandise, I already pre ordered this, but I'm telling you right now, there's a Transformers Back to the Future action figure. So, like, basically, the DeLorean transforms. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's so and cool. Hasbro's putting it out. Damn you, Troy. Uh, Damn, that's that's really cool. Duh, I didn't know it. Super cool. Hasbro has <laughs> so much of my money. Damn. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Exactly. Just from the Marvel Legends. Oh alone. my god. Dang, oh, Troy. Yeah, yeah. Troy, those are some solid, solid recommendations. So some of the ones uh, uh it, it sounds like Deadly Class, uh Red Room by Ed Piscor, mm-hmm. um uh Star Wars uh, was it was it called like War of the Bounty Hunters? Was that the name? Yeah, of it? War of the Bounty Hunters, yep. Warrior the Bounty Hunters. And then I, I didn't catch that French one. What was that French one? You'd caught oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here to say it again. Well, if, you're looking to, if you're trying to find it on the website, it's MFKZ. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> those are great acronyms. So those are those are really good suggestions. And I suggest anyone listening to go ahead and check those out. Um, see, we decided to go ahead and, and have some fun with this as well and, and, and chime in. And I gave us – I thought it'd be cool if we switched it up and you looked – through the previous catalog to find some things that you think I would enjoy and I would do the same thing. Mm, a we, friendship test, if you will. You know what? <laughs> yes. And I have mm. I have full faith, even though I probably shouldn't, that, that you that you know me, long, that we've known each other long enough that your recommendations are going to be mm, spot on. Chef's kiss. What do you got for me, brother? You I, go first. I'll, I'll go, I'll go I, I did not know you were putting that much faith in me. So I decided that... I think this is a title that you would be into um, based on how long I've known you, uh, well over uh, 100 years. And I think uh, Jungle Fantasy, the character's (laughs) name is Fauna. Uh, I think it's, you know, you would like it. Page 286 on the previous catalog. Wait, isn't that the the adult comic book section? The tasteful adult comic section, Botter, please. You You know, I had a feeling that you would drop the ball, but I I wanted to push it to the side. Adult fantasy, Cesar? Are you mad at me? Adult fantasy? Are you mad at me? No, you know I love adult fantasy comic books. (laughs) Just don't tell everybody. (laughs) (laughs) But not appropriate for the show. Okay, here's the real pick. Here's the real pick. Uh, It actually isn't uh, a comic because you put toys on the the menu. 
Um, this is something in in the uh, is the ghost of things yet to come here. It's the uh, Scotty Young apocalypse figure. It's coming out in there, the fall, dude. And yes, I know that you. Yes, this has been on your radar because I was looking through something and your eyes went Zoot, and it darted over it and you saw it and you were like. Uh, like you let out a little bit of a swoon, like uh, <laughs> like one of those came out, and I didn't know what it was, and I was like, "Oh, okay, my man really wants this thing." So yes, now you're on the right track. That's got a young apocalypse figure. It literally had a full page spread in oh, this, I know. In I'm this aware. catalog. I'm aware. Like, I'm aware. I cannot wait. All right, do me now. Okay, fool. All right, so here's the first one that I saw. I was like, "Yo, C would love this." Mm. On page mm. uh, nine, uh, on page G ninety four. So if you got the preview, you got to sw- uh, sw- swap it over. On G94, there is a page for Junji Ito figures. You know me too well. They're coming out with Junji you know Ito figures well. that look just as scary as the fucking comic. I cannot have them in my house. <laughs> <laughs> my wife will kill me. And then I, I know how much you love and respect uh, uh, the, the Alien and, and Predator fran- uh, franchise. Oh, sure. Um, in the little Marvel previews book that comes free with all the previous catalogs, there uh-huh. is a solicitation for an issue of Aliens written by Philip uh, K. Johnson, Philip Kennedy Johnson, and artwork by your boy Salvador Luca. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're on issue four now. Yes. So those are my two that I'm like, yo, see what yeah, love yeah. How, How'd I do? Yeah, you do well. You do well. I feel a little bad that I didn't take it seriously. So, uh, well, I mean, granted, like I said, I don't mind the don't fantasy. Just maybe not on the show. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, buddy. Wink, All wink. Right. So, look, check it out. We've been talking about uh, uh, retailers and, and comic shops. Troy, I want to introduce a special segment we created for this episode because we knew you'd be on the show. Um, we reached out to our good buddy and good friend of the show, Ben Kingsbury, who happens to own Gotham City Limit. You might recall that name because you had him on your show uh, yeah, for previews. Yeah, for previews world last year in May. It was around the same time when you know it was on on the onset of, of COVID and, and you know the yeah. world shutting down. Comic shops all over the country were closing their doors. You had been on the show to talk about how Gotham City Limit was doing during those times, you know, some of the strategies they were taking. So we reached out to Ben. I said, yo, we got Troy, your boy Troy coming on the show. He got mm-hmm. super excited and he had a question that we, we, he wanted us to ask you. Yep. So uh, this first Let's one here, it. this first one here, he writes, uh, playing and trading cards have made a huge resurgence recently. Sure have. Any plans to keep expanding into that field? And do you focus the, on that in your show? Uh, yeah, actually they are. Um, there's a, uh, there's actually a new line. I don't think I I don't know if I can say it exactly. Cause I might, I don't know if how it's going to go so far. Share the exclusive, yeah. share the exclusive, <laughs> share the exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the, long story short, uh, Diamond specifically is looking at the expansion of the collectible card market and they're diving into it. Um, and I know that there's a really big license that they have already attained. So mm. I will say that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. That that's I feel like that's exclusive enough. You heard that yeah, here yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. That's cool. He's so hungry. <laughs> look, I, I went into the I went into the comic shop uh last week into Gotham City Limit and he had a binder of Pokemon cards. I was like, Ben, why do you have Pokemon cards here? He was like, You have no idea how many people come into the shop on oh, a weekly yeah. basis asking about Pokemon cards. What if he just trading- slapped you? He almost did. And he was just like, because I'm sweet, bro. <laughs> yeah, which is a bad thing to say. He almost did. The only reason he didn't was because he was dealing with a customer. But he gave me that sign of like, I sw- ooh, ask me something stupid. But the other question he's got for you, Troy, is modern TV has made popular a ton of comic stories from the past, such mm-hmm. as The Boys and Invincible. Do you have any new TV series based on comics that you're looking forward to? Mm. Um, that I'm looking forward to. I mean, well... Like, yeah, look, the, the, the obvious answer this week, right, is that last episode of Falcon Winter Soldier. God. I am so at the, I'm just leaning at the edge of my seat, just like, please be good, because you guys have set this up so nicely. Oh, and then, oof. Chef's kiss. Like, Hell yeah. Yeah, like, legit. Like, uh, I felt like the last, I, you know, I felt like with WandaVision, like, I saw people early on kind of like, I don't like this. It's not what I expect. It's not this. It's not that. Part of me was kind of like, well, they kind of told you what they were going to do with it. It's like whatever, but I feel like ultimately the second to last episode of WandaVision was the best episode, and then the final episode was kind of like, eh, okay, I'm really, really because every episode of Winter Soldier, uh, Falcon Winter Soldier, has been really strong, flawless and victory. The last one, the last one, the last one was the strongest, and I'm like, please end strong, please, 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 please. I have a theory that anything that is revolving around Marvel's spy espionage world is where 
they shine the most. D- yes. And, yeah, yes, absolutely. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I get so no, no, so yeah, yeah. stupid excited about this because my favorite movie in the entire MCU is Winter Soldier because oh, it's yeah. that perfect '70s mm-hmm. spy uh, paranoia mm-hmm. film like tribute yeah. that the Russos are really good at, mm-hmm. and they got Henry Jackman back to do the music for yeah, the show. Yeah, did, I mean, yeah. like it's so beautifully done, and like mm-hmm. all, it, it's, I keep <laughs> it's funny like. People keep coming up to me because at work, like, it's like, hey, he's the comic guy, you know, like, (laughs) they're like, hey, like coming up to me after talking about Falcon and Winter Soldier. And they're like, you know, I didn't know, but this this show is getting into some really complicated things and some interesting political things. I'm like. Yeah, it yeah, it's called comics. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of cool things sure. in there. You should get into them. You know, like oh, yeah. Yeah. it's it's yeah. And then a little bit, I have to kind of suppress the Mister Glass inside of myself. You know, like just <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you 100, percent man. Like I think that uh, yeah, I, like it's interesting to me that uh, these. I feel like when Marvel shines, these Marvel movies or Marvel movies and TV shows shine is when they. Uh, they branched out, you know, and they really kind of allowed themselves to kind of tackle, like, not even complicated issues, just to complicate the Marvel cinematic universe. Mm. And I feel like that's what we're getting with this show. And like I said, I really, really hope that it's strong because I have the stuff left to write every single week. And I appreciate you taking those questions from Ben. And I wanted to give Ben Kingsbury a shout out. And it kind of leads me to to my last question for you, Troy. Uh, yeah. Speaking about, you know, uh, being a, a creator of comics yourself and, and, you know, kind of engaging fans across the spectrum, whether, you know, they've been longtime fans or, or new fans. But as someone, you know, who not only spends their day lamenting about comics and graphic novels and all the latest releases, but, you know, you're also a co-founder, like we said, of the comic publishing company Rexco Comics. Right, right. And, and, you know, you, you guys boast a mission statement to welcome both new readers and longtime fans in the medium. So I wanted to ask you, what's some advice that you'd give a new reader or, or, or an aspiring collector in regard to approaching the comic medium and everything that comes with this culture? Um, you know, I like look. I think that uh, you know, just I, I think just ignore all the noise. Like, yeah, I just like it, like I kind of feel like there's so much of that around comics right now. There's so much noise. Like, it's just a lot of things that don't. There's a lot of discrediting or like not really considering authorial intent, which I think is a big thing for me. Like, what is the intention of the creator? Not necessarily what you saw in it. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because I but like you know. What was the intention of the creator? And I've gotten into arguments with some of my friends about this. I've been falling out with people about this, um, including my own cousin who does agree with me on this. But like, you know, it's like, I just feel strongly about this, which is that, uh, you know, what the creator says it is, is what it is, you know? And, you know, all these, you know, people love to psychoanalyze people, especially after people get canceled. They love to psychoanalyze uh, the creator and, you know, put them on the couch and like say, well, you see, this panel this is really what this is about and all this other stuff and i'm just like you know what i don't need all that i don't need to know that much about these creators like you know look i've interviewed creators you know but at the same time like i'm not asking him about his dating life i'm not asking garth this about his personal life like i'm not asking about his mom like you know i'm not asking him about like you know actually i did that he actually didn't tell me about his mom <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I'm not asking him like you know to make work divulge like his soul to me. You know, I just don't want to know them on that level. Um, and and I think that's some of that's because like you know you will be disappointed and you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Um, but also I'm like it's all there on page on the page. Like what they're trying to say is there on the page. Hmm. And I would much rather experience it experience it the way they want to experience it. Instead of, you know, going to Bleeding Cool and reading what, you know, like, you know, some random person on that website thinks about it in the comment section or even in the article. Their projection know, of it. The projection of it. Yeah, that's what, that thing that's what I was trying to get to. Like, you know, uh, you know, going to the comment section, even on our own page sometimes, like even on previews or free comic book day. Uh, and like, you know, seeing how people are like projecting their concerns or anxieties onto it and all sort of stuff. I mean, even, you know, we, we mentioned the Punisher thing that's also kind of a, that's kind of that too as well. Like, you know, it's just, you know, I'm just kind of done with it. Like, you know, I'd much rather experience the medium the way that I want to experience it. So I kind of feel like, look, if you're a reader, if you're a collector, I would say pay attention to what the creators are saying and then decide for yourself, you know? 
Uh, but yeah, to invite all this other commentary, we're just in this this hot take reaction video, like endless commentary stretch. And I kind of feel like art really suffers in that in that in that realm, like in that in this reality. You know, engage with the art, and only engage with the art. And you know, the minute you start pulling all these other things into it, like it becomes about something else, and I just don't think that's healthy or useful. And I think it's dangerous too in a lot of ways too. So that's what I would tell readers and collectors, like especially if you're someone who feels like you're falling out of love with comics or movies or television. Maybe it's the way you're getting it. Maybe it's the way that you're getting it. Maybe it's the avenues that you're, you're you know, you're, 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 uh, experiencing. The consumption yeah. might be done in the wrong way. Exactly. You know, yeah. exactly. And I think that that's important. Like I, it's funny. I, I had a conversation kind of similar to this. A statement you had made earlier that shouldn't be controversial, but somehow some people think it is in the weird sort of uh, aesthetic that we live in now, uh, where if the artist, regardless of whatever the medium specifies what they were trying to say with their specific piece of artwork. That's what they were trying to say. You don't get to project some artists leave room for interpretation like that. And they almost relish in it. Right. Like I, I, in films, the, the closest thing I can think of is William, uh, William Friedkin's the exorcist where like Mm -hmm. he has his cut where it kind of, a lot of people think it ends on a downer in his mind. He's like, I don't see it as a downer. If you do, then you're projecting your thing on it, you know, but I mm-hmm. like to leave it open. And so that way can people can project whatever they want, right? That's an instance where somebody said to interpret it how you will. But like if an artist like, I don't know, like <laughs> somebody like Frank Miller comes out and says, no, this this is what I meant. Sorry, that's what he meant. Like, I don't yeah. know what to say. So it's it's it, I've heard the term non traversy which yeah. <laughs> which makes me laugh because it's true like it's a non this is a non traversy it's not even right. a real thing but i was gonna say just say like especially after 2020 i think that was really like the 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 moment for me where i was just like you know what? i don't care about this like i just like yeah like there's just so much noise out there so we're about to sit here Thank God, Troy, because once that MF Doom comic comes out, I am going to do 500 <laughs> Easter eggs you missed. <laughs> <laughs> Click on this, You're subscribe, cool, smash that like button, yeah. and I'll tell you exactly right. what Troy was thinking. <laughs> but, but Troy, I, I think your words definitely resonate with me because something that we always say on this show is, you know, read what you like. You know, like I, I think I think it's easy to get kind of like like you were kind of hinting at, like spun up or, or invested into like this very negative kind of culture that comes with, you know, with, with fandom. It's a juggernaut, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and a lot of times like, yo, do you like it? Well, then that's all that you need. Yep, to, that's all, all you need. Yep. Go ahead and dive in and, and jump in. Cause comic books, that's what I love about, you know, the medium is that there is something for everyone, you know? Yes. Um, so I, I always advocate that. And I appreciate that you got to share those words with us. And I appreciate that yeah. you got to share your time with us, man. Like, yeah, like thanks, I said, I, I really enjoy w- what you're doing. Um, like I said, you, you were put on my radar when you had been on the show. I thought that was a, a really cool thing to see, you know, a company like previews do is reaching out and putting a spotlight, um, on comic shops, you know, during these difficult times. So, you know, previews has been a part of, you know, I think it's safe to say me and Cesar's life for, oh, for sure. you know, as long as we've been going to the shops and probably the same thing for a lot of people who are listening that have been collecting for a long time. So I wanted to give you a chance to go ahead and, and, and do those shameless plugs and, and tell people where they can find you or where they can tune into previews and a little more and where they can find that MF Doom comic, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, and we're going to be posting it, but, uh, Artist Smack, editor Maya Crown, uh, myself, um, I believe, and World Design. Um, uh, these are all people that have been uh, involved in the creative process for making this comic. Um, and we're all going to just signal these to on the 20th. Uh, we're going to sit on 420. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like if you follow me, Troy Jeffrey Allen, pretty much anywhere, uh, you will see it. Like, you know, uh, I make a point not to post a lot anymore. So <laughs> uh, it'll be the most likely at the top of my feed uh, by the time this airs and probably at the top of my feed for several more weeks. Um, uh, outside of that, actually, yeah, I'm going to be launching this week. Uh, uh, I'll be launching uh, Create the Culture dot today, um, which has been something that's been long gestating. Like I, I talked earlier about uh, how I want. I just, I you know, I, you know, we're talking about art and like things are good for art, and I feel like the best thing you can do is just create stuff and just kind of like and, and let it go. 
Like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, as much as we talk about, like, interpretation, like, you know, I want to create it, and then I want to move on to create something else. You know what I mean? And I'm not naive about uh, the fact that you can't control what people look into it, um, but, but I can just keep creating. Like, that's what I can do. Oh, sure, dude. And Chase that whimsy, man. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and so create the culture dot today is the beginning of a much longer initiative that like will be stretching out hopefully into next year as well as like the past next year where I'm going to be making basically comics really for myself. I'll be completely totally honest with you. And you know, you've heard my the people I like, right? It's it's like Jack Chan and <laughs> Grant Morrison and you know uh, Garth Ennis. So if I mean if that's the type of stuff you're into, MF film, Gene Gray. Uh, maybe a little bit of Steven Spielberg because you can't help what you grew up on, right? Sure. Like, you know, uh, if, uh, if if that sounds like something you're into, then definitely check it out this week because that's going to watch this week. And the NFT comic is going to be hosted on CreateTheCulture.today. Cool. Uh, so a website. So, and then I'm going to be adding more comics to it. And then hopefully there'll be an uh, additional Kickstarter starting in 2020, late 2021, early 2020. Without trying to get uh, overly philosophical, man, like I, I highly encourage you to keep chasing that whimsy, dude, honestly, Thanks. just because it like, you know, without getting weird, anytime you dip your toe as an artist uh, and by artist, I mean both writer and telling a story through the pictorial way um, through sequential art and comics, you are almost kind of like this uh, a shaman of sorts, right? You're like you're like a living time machine that people can look at and they can look at what you did and somewhere in their subconscious realize that we've been telling stories that way for a long time, a long time. And and you you get to be a part of that legacy, man. So like I, I, you know, I I've, I've dabbled in comic making myself, you know, once upon a time and it's neat to just kind of be like, wow, I did this. Like, wow, you know, like, and like you said, and then you move on, like you've, you have made your magical sigil now move on. You know, I mean, if you're into Grant Morrison, Uh you know about chaos magic and all that stuff. Like, (laughs) I I mean, am I wrong in assuming that, you know, the story behind the invisibles and his, his, was it how many year long magical sigil? Like, you know, do I subscribe to all of it? Eh. But I, it's neat. It's cool to be a part of that. And that, that legacy of creation and that, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I get jazzed when people say stuff like, look, I'm doing this for me. And it's just like, yes, that that's good. Excellent. That's yeah. 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 No, actually, no, you took the words out of my mouth on that. I was like, you're speaking the Grant Morrison language right now. I told yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I fired off a magical sigil before I came. I yelled, I got drunk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I read something the other day about the power of words. Right. And, um, uh, the importance of words, you know, I, I, look, I, I, I know in the past I've been reckless with my words and trying to not do that, you know, as an adult um, and like take consideration. And like, I think the most compelling argument, regardless of your religion, like, sure. you know, but the most compar- compelling argument I read recently, why words are important, because in the beginning there was nothing and then God spoke. Boom. Hmm. You know, and like, like I said, regardless of your religion, like, you know, I'm just, I just find that very interesting, very fascinating to, to understand it in those terms. Like, there was nothing, and then there were words. And when you really think about it, like that's kind of like this crazy thing to be able to communicate with each other, and that we can understand each other's languages if we try to. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, and it's also kind of wild that like you know the internet has kind of turned language into its own thing, right? For better or worse. Um, and then you add art to that, and and, and an artist interprets interprets your words. And it's just, it's amazing. It's cool. If I sound like Morrison, you sound like Kirby right now. I mean, I, I'm with it. I'm with Do it. me. Who, who, who I sound like? Get out of here, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you, you bother me, see? Troy, hopefully this won't be the, the last time we, we have you on the show. I know me and C are looking forward to c- coming on previews uh, oh, yeah. world and yeah. uh, uh, here soon in, in May, right? In May. Um but man, this was a great conversation, man. Like yeah. seriously, thank, thank you, you so guys, much for your man. time and, and opening up and sharing all that stuff. I want to go ahead and let our listeners know I, I will make it easy on you and I'll have all the links to everything that Troy Beautiful. brought up in the show notes to keep it easy. Check out the MF Doom comic. Check out previews. Check out what Troy's working on as well. Um, Troy, a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.